All right, your attention, please. Thank you for joining us. It's my great uh, pleasure today to introduce Dr. Norna Robertson of Caltech uh, and the University of Glasgow. Um, she is a part-time uh, professorship, or she, she was full-time for 20 years at, at Glasgow. She now holds that position, uh, but does her work with um, Advanced LIGO, the uh, um, Laser Interferometric Gravitational Observatory, which I'm sure she'll, she'll describe. Um, at Caltech, so she's on leave from, from Glasgow to, to work at Caltech. Um, her research is in experimental um, work towards detection of gravitational waves. We'll get to hear all about that. Um, it's kind of an interesting story that this is the year, the, the centennial of Einstein publishing his, his initial works on um, general relativity. So he um, came up with the ideas of general relativity and a lot of other things in uh, around 1905, but he was working behind the scenes on a broader, more full model, that's general relativity. And so by 1915, he started to publish these papers, and so it's the centennial of that this year. So uh, I called the Speaker's Bureau for uh, people who study general relativity, and they gave me Dr. Norna Robertson's name, and I thought, oh, I've done this great job. I, you know, I found someone, and, and I talked to our department chair, Lynn Kaminsky, and she said, well, you could have just asked me. Norna's a friend and a colleague. So that's all worked out really well, and uh, I'm three pleased that, that we have her here today. Um, and so let's give a, a warm uh, a round of applause for Dr. Norna Robertson. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. So, um, as Scott was saying, I'm going to tell you all about search for gravitational waves. And here's an outline. Um, I'm sure that many of you actually probably may have heard of gravitational waves, but have no idea what they are and how they're produced and how we might detect them. So I'll give you a basic introduction to that. Then I'll talk about our project, LIGO, and in particular, Advanced LIGO, which is an upgrade to the LIGO project I'm going to focus on the area that I'm, the, I'm more expert on, which is the suspension design, just to give you a feel for um, the intricacies that are involved in making an experiment like this work, and then I'll get to the conclusions. So here is the introduction. We all know that over 300 years ago, Newton gave us his theory of gravity, and it can be clearly explained by a nice simple equation, f equals gmm over r squared. Um, we understand why apples fall to the ground, why planets go around the sun and so on, and that, that um, expression of gravity worked for 300 years, but of course it took the genius of Einstein to come up with an even deeper theory of gravity, and in his theory, gravitation is the curvature of space-time. Here it's represented by a sort of two-dimensional picture, like a rubber sheet and an object placed on that rubber sheet will bend it, and that's what we mean by curvature of space-time. Now, at this point, I could go on and give you some really rather horrendous field equations from Einstein, but I'm actually an experimentalist, so I'm not going to do that. I think this cartoon sums up exactly the way I'm going to approach Einstein. I'm going to simplify it and speak to it from an experimentalist point of view. So, if gravity is the curvature of space-time, then what a gravitational wave is, is a ripple in space-time. We can make a very simple analogy to what happens when you drop a stone into a pond and we see the ripples spreading out from where the stone has dropped in. And that's exactly what a gravitational wave does as it spreads out through space. And we can see areas here, if I can get this uh, working, where space is stretched and there's other areas where space is compressed. So how, how could we produce gravitational waves? Well, we can draw certain analogies between the gravitational force and the electromagnetic force. In particular, um, gravitational waves are produced by matter accelerating, mass accelerating, whereas electromagnetic waves are produced by charge accelerating. We know that electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light, and the prediction is that gravitational waves will travel at the same speed. But we always have to be very careful when we make analogies because this one doesn't go too far. Basically, there are several reasons that they're not quite the same. 
first of all, the gravitational force is much weaker than the electromagnetic force, something like 10 to the 40th times weaker. Secondly, you have two sorts of charge, positive and negative, but only one sign of mass. And that means that you don't get simple dipole radiation. Um, you need asymmetric accelerations to produce gravitational waves. And also because of the weakness, you need huge masses. And so, much as we might like to try and do an experiment in the lab where we produce gravitational waves on one side of the, the lab, like a Hertzian um, production of electromagnetic waves, and you detect on the other side, we just absolutely cannot do that by many, many orders of magnitude. We cannot produce a strong gravitational wave. So we have to look for elsewhere for our sources, and our sources are astrophysical, where we have got huge masses that can undergo huge accelerations. So gravitational waves have not yet been detected. Perhaps I should have started with that right at the beginning. They have not yet been detected, but there is very good indirect evidence for them, in particular from this binary pulsar, and they're always given funny numbers like that, which is the position in the sky, PSR 1913 plus 16. It's a system of two very dense stars, those are called neutron stars, which are orbiting around each other. A neutron star, by the way, is so dense that if you took a spoonful of neutron star material, it would weigh something like a billion tons. So they're incredibly dense objects. And these two are orbiting around each other, and they're actually, the, the orbit is decaying. They're going around each other, and they're moving closer and closer together, and they will eventually coalesce. But in fact, um, it's not going to happen for something like 300 million years, so we don't waste our breath waiting for that. But as they're orbiting around each other and moving in towards each other and speeding up, they're giving off energy. They're giving off gravitational waves. And what um, Halston Taylor did, who won the Nobel Prize for studying this um, in 1993, was they measured how that shift in the orbital period was changing with time. And this is a graph of their experimental data of the orbital phase shift against date. This is 1974, this is 1982, this is the first um, first um, few years of observing this, it's been observed since then and it fits even even better. The curve here is the curve if the energy was being lost from gravitational waves and it's a very good fit to the data. So that's very strong evidence that in this system gravitational waves are being emitted. They're at a very low, low frequency because of the orbit at the moment. So they're not the sort of waves we could detect but other, other um, such binary systems we could look for. And the signal you get from them is, is like this. And this is it working its way towards the final coalescence. The frequency will change because they're getting closer and closer to each other and speeding up. And then finally, they bang together. And the amplitude will chirp like a rising note. And so in fact, that helps us to try and look for signals from these sort of events because we can use something called matched filter techniques to look for these signals in a background of noise. If we get a something that matches up to the shape of this, then we're pretty confident that we've seen such an event. There are other sources as well. So I'm just sort of giving you a, a sort of zoo of types of gravitational wave sources. Um, our data analysis groups within LIGO are divided into four categories. Um, bursts, which are events that would happen once and never again, like a supernova explosion where you've got matter. When a star comes to the end of its um, fuel burning life, it can't support itself against gravity and it will collapse catastrophically. Well, that's an event where you'd expect gravitational waves to be given off. Then I've talked about these uh, coalescences of very dense stars or even of black holes. Um, continuous um, sources, uh, that would be a gravitational wave with the same frequency going on and on for a long time. We'd expect that from a pulsar, that's a, a, a radio-emitting neutron star, because it's rotating. And if there's a little mountain, a little bump on that as it rotates, then it has a change in quadrupole moment, and that means that gravitational waves would be given off. And finally, we expect them to be a random background, just as you have the cosmic microwave background in electromagnetic waves. We expect a random background of gravitational waves from all sorts of different um, sources, in particular from cosmology, from the early, early times in the universe. 
and um, so that's our fourth type of source. Yes. Dr. Robertson, it's funny you said a mountain, we need asymmetry for this, yes. you talked about that. When I think of, um, we just said a spoonful and, and, and how many, was it millions of tons? In yes, that, a billion in, tons or something. Um, you know, what it, do you know what the size scale of a mountain on a neutron star is? Yeah, it like a centimeter like, or yes, something? Yes, it's that sort of order. It's absolutely tiny. Mountain is not quite the right word. A neutron star is about 10 kilometers in, in size. And so a small thing like an inch or something. But if they have a bump, that's, a, a that's bump. an inch. That or will... if they're asymmetric for other reasons, like they're non-spherical because they're spinning. But yes, a little mountain on them. A mountain is not the right word. A little bump. Um, I have a little animation here, if I can uh, get it working, which is an animation of two um, <coughs> a binary coalescence. And um, what you're looking out for are the red waves, which are the gravitational waves, as these two objects fall in towards each other. And um, we're zoom zooming out there, and then we see these waves spreading out through space. and they get more intense as you get to that final coalescence and then you end up with a single object in the middle and it rings down and so you get a few more waves coming out of it. Now I've mentioned black holes as a possible source of a supernova explosion can leave a black hole at the centre. Um, there are, is evidence for black holes already and one of the nicest parts of evidence is this animation on the right, on the left rather, which um, is tracking stars moving around our, cent our center of our galaxy. And this is data over something like 14 years. I'll get it going. At least I hope I get it going. If I can. Where's my pointer going? There we go. They zoom in and watch these stars. Especially, I like the one at the left hand side, which zooms in so fast. I'll do it once again so you see this. They have tracked the motion stars around this central object in our galaxy and from their motion you can deduce that there must be an incredibly um, dense object in there that weighs something like a million solar masses and that's the big so, um, black hole at the centre of our galaxy. There are black holes in other galaxies. This is a nice image um, from the Chandra satellite and if these two black holes were falling in towards each other, you would get gravitational waves. However, for these supermassive black holes, rather than sort of solar mass size, the waves would be at a much lower frequency than we would be able to detect with our ground-based detectors. But this is something that if we ever fly a gravitational de detector in space, it would pick up signals from supermassive black holes colliding with each other and interacting. So how actually are we going to detect? We see there's a whole astronomy of possible signals that might produce gravitational waves. Well, how we detect them is we go back to this picture of this is a two-dimensional rubber sheet type picture, and we can see that if you were monitoring the separation of two points on that um, rubber sheet, if you like, they would be changing in separation. And so a simplest detector might be two objects separated by a distance L, and the gravitational wave is like a strain in space. Strain, remember, is the change in length divided by the length. So that's delta L over L. And we characterize gravitational wave by this constant call, or not constant, but this um, letter called H, which is the gravitational wave strain. And it's equal to delta L upon L. So if we had some supernova, and it went bang in a nearby galaxy and we got signals coming from that, what sort of size of signal would it be? Well, it's absolutely tiny. This strain for the largest signals that we might possibly get is about 10 to the minus 19. But that would be a very, very infrequent event. We have to have something like um, three or four orders of magnitude more or less, if you like, in sensitivity, smaller number to be sure that we're going to detect a reasonable event rate. And let's just focus on what that means. That means if I had two objects a meter apart, I would have to measure the change in their length of 10 to the minus 22 meters. 
I can hear some of you thinking that sounds absolutely impossible. Well, I hope I'm going to explain how it's not impossible, although we wouldn't have our objects just a metre apart. There's one clue. Um, just to put that into perspective, to remind the students what's the size of a proton nucleus, it's about 10 to the minus 15 metres. So we're several orders of magnitude smaller than the size of a proton that we're trying to measure. One way to do this, and it's the way that we use in LIGO and other experiments around the world, is to use laser light to make measurements of distance. And this is a Michelson interferometer. I saw one in, in Dr. Severson's lab this afternoon, and some of you may have done experiments with a Michelson interferometer. It's a wonderful way of measuring distance. You take a laser, you hit a beam splitter, half the light goes along one arm, half goes in the other direction, these are mirrors at the end, they reflect it back and they can recombine and we see an interference signal on the photodiode. If one of the mirrors moves with respect to the other so the arm lengths change, you get a changing signal at the photodiode and that's exactly what, what a technique that we can use for looking for gravitational waves. In fact, in the bottom left here is a sequence um, of looking at what happens to a ring of particles as a gravitational wave impinges into the board and a quarter of a period of the frequency of the wave you get one arm stretching and the other arm compressing that's the quadruple nature of the wave it expands um, space in one direction at the same time as squeezing it in the other half a cycle later back to a circle then you get an ellipse again and back to a circle so as that gravitational wave passes by you will get a change in the relative arm lengths and hence, you might be able to detect your gravitational wave. So an interferometer looks like it might be a good way of doing this experiment. Um, a nice advantage of an interferometer is that your, your laser, everyone thinks of a laser as right on one frequency, very, very pure. But in fact, it is, it is fluctuating a little. The wavelength is not exactly constant. But if you have an interferometer with equal arm lengths, then to first order the fluctuations in the intensity, in the frequency or wavelength of the light cancels out and you can still get a signal. So that's one advantage of using an interferometer. Um, it matches to that quadruple nature of the wave that I talked about. Um, it's also wide band. By, by that I mean that you can detect waves over a wide frequency region. In fact, LIGO or advanced LIGO is designed to detect waves from about 10 hertz to a few <coughs> kilohertz. It's like the audio band, if you like. Um, the earliest type of gravitational wave detectors that people built were bar detectors. They were resonant bar detectors. They were made from something like aluminium, a big cylinder. It was hung in a, in a vacuum chamber. A gravitational wave impinging and that would make it ring, it would make it ring at its fundamental resonant frequency. People tried and, uh, to develop those sorts of detectors and they did not detect any gravitational waves. One of their disadvantages is that they only respond to a particular frequency, the one that makes them ring. Whereas the interferometer, by its nature, it is not frequency dependent. And finally, you can do this a trick. Well, first of all, you can make your interferometer long. And remember, it's a tidal strain we're trying to measure. So you can make the arm lengths long. But you can also fold the light between mirrors in your two arms to make it look as if it was even longer. And for instance, think of those two mirrors here separating. The light has to bounce backwards and forwards, so it's traveling much further. Basically, it's, it's, it's um, multiplied up by the number of bounces. And there's two ways of doing this. This is called a delay line, where the spots are all discrete on uh, the mirrors. Here, we have a fab repairal cavity, where it's like collapsing all the spots on top of each other. But basically, they work in the same way. They amplify the signal that we're looking for. So finally, LIGO. What is LIGO? Well. Um, as we already heard, it's Laser Interferometer Gravitational <coughs> Wave Observatory. And in fact, there are two observatories in, in the USA. One is in Wa Washington State, uh, on the Hanford Reservation, way up there, up the northwest. And the other one is in the southeast, in Louisiana, in Livingston, which is just outside Baton Rouge and quite near to New Orleans. And they're about 3,000 kilometers apart. This was in high desert, this was in, in forests, and it's a bit swampy and daft there. Why, why did 
the NSA fund two observatories? Well, we're trying to detect something that's very, very weak in a lot of noise. If you made a detection with one observatory, people would say, is that really a gravitational wave? Couldn't it be maybe a local seismic disturbance or something like that? But if you do a coincidence experiment with two detectors, or at least two detectors, then the possibility that you're detecting something local is much, much less, and you have much more confidence that you've actually detected something that's astrophysical in origin. By the way, it was um, designed and built by Caltech and MIT, so there's really four places in the USA that's part of the LIGO, part of LIGO, that's Caltech, MIT, Hanford, and Livingston. However, there's an even bigger collaboration of people from many countries all over the world. There's something like 900 people in the LIGO scientific collaboration um, from something like 50 institutes um, all around, in colleges and universities all around the world. And Sonoma State is up there. This is Lynn. She's part of the LIGO scientific collaboration. So you can see that um, there are a lot of people working on the detection of gravitational waves. And this is just one of the collaborations um, in the world. This is the one for LIGO. Let me say a little bit about what limits our sensitivity. It sounds like, oh, we just build a Michelson interferometer and there we are, we've got a detector that's going to get to 10 to minus 22. You're going to see several graphs like this, so let me just spend a minute explaining what's plotted here. Along the bottom is frequency, and you might remember I said the sort of frequencies that we're trying to detect are something in the 10 to 1,000 hertz, or maybe a bit higher than 1,000 hertz. Up the side is this quantity H. That's the strain. Now we do, because it's a, a noise is involved in this, we actually have funny units with this per root hertz, but just think of it as a strain in a one hertz bandwidth that's plotted up the side. And there are lots of things here, and I'm not going to go into all of these, but they can all limit the sensitivity. If you have a signal that's in this sort of region, this sort of strength, or this sort of frequency, you would be able to see it. That's what this big yellow patch is. And it's bounded for, this is for the first LIGO experiments, it's bounded by three major noise sources. Shot noise, shot noise is basically counting photons. If you have laser light and it's hitting a photodiode, then in fact there's photons of light hitting a photodiode. If there's n photons hitting that photodiode, then by random processes there'll be root n um, fluctuation on that number. So, in fact, you can improve your shot noise by increasing the n because it's, um, it increases with the square root of the number of, um, number of photons that are detected. And this is that part of the region. Thermal noise is fluctuations due to the fact that the molecules are above absolute zero. Absolute zero, they would be still. But anything at room temperature, the, most, the molecules are all jostling around, and that's a background of noise that we have to fight against. And finally, the ground is always moving. You're not always aware of it. Of course, in California, ever so often you get earthquakes, but even when there are no earthquakes, the ground is moving around about a micron, something like that, all the time. And that sort of noise level would just completely drown out our experiment. So we have to take great care in isolating our experiment from seismic noise, which is just ground vibrations. And then there are lots of technical noise sources. I just listed a few there. You've got to deal with all of those as well. We, t we sometimes call these ones the fundamental noise sources, but of course all noise sources are a problem. So how do we, in the initial LIGO experiments, which I'll tell you some results from in a minute, how did we mitigate these noise sources? Well, you use a, a nice um, beefy laser, a 10 watt Neodym Nyag laser was what was used. Um, and then here's this interferometer, again. There's an extra mirror in there. It's called a power recycling mirror. This is a way of even more building up the power in your detector. If you're working on a, an interferometer where you match the arms so that at the output, you're sitting close to a dark fringe, so very little light coming out, where's all the light gone? It's not getting lost in the mirrors because we have very high quality reflecting surfaces it all actually heads back towards the laser. So if you put a partially transmitting mirror in front of the laser, you can send it all back in again, and it's like increasing the whole power in the interferometer. 
So that's what this um, is all about. Thermal noise, we choose materials that are very pure, and in that case, um, because they're very pure, the thermal noise is all kept in a small band around about the resonant frequencies, and off resonance, you do not get so much motion. Seismic noise, we build up a series of isolation stages, um, which are basically um, the first stage of this was like a mass on a spring, and above the resonant frequency of that, you isolate your, your uh, detector. And then the final, the mirror is on a pendulum suspension, of which I'll say a lot more later. Also, you have to operate the whole thing under high vacuum because just fluctuations of the air would be a, a signal, a noise source that would completely swamp out the, the signal you're trying to look for. So how did we do an initial lag? Well, here's this curve again. This is H up the side against frequency. And then um, the best is that magenta curve, which got close to 10 to the minus 23 in a one hertz bandwidth over the years. You might not be able to read all of this, but all these curves were from 2002 to 2007 as we improved the sensitivity of the detector. And we characterize how well our detector is by how far out in space we could see these neutron star, neutron star binary coalescences. And the best sensitivity we got to with the initial LIGO was 16 megaparsecs. I'll explain that in a minute. But then we did a few upgrades and we got, in fact, to 20 megaparsecs. Now, a parsec is approximately three light years. And to give you a feeling for how far out you're seeing in space here, parsecs are sort of the distances between stars. Kiloparsecs is the sort of scale of our galaxy. The, the Milky Way is about 30 kiloparsecs in diameter. Megaparsecs is taking you out to other galaxies. And 16 megaparsecs takes you to the nearest neighboring large <coughs> cluster of galaxies, which is called the Virgo Cluster. So if we can look over space out to those sort of regions, then you know, we might be able to see one of these neutron star, neutron star coalescences. Well, did we see anything? No. <laughs> no detections have yet been made of any gravitational waves. But we've published lots of papers, and you might say, how on earth have we published all these papers? Well, they're basically upper limits on different types of sources, on these binary coalescences, on um, burst-like type sources, on the stochastic random background. I highlight a couple here which I like. Um, you may have heard of gamma ray bursts. These are very, very bright bursts of gamma rays that we can detect from space using satellites. And one of them in, I think it was about 2007, was seen in the direction of our nearest neighboring galaxy, which is the Andromeda galaxy. It's about a megaparsec away from us. And we looked for it in our data. If that gamma ray burst happened because of a binary neutron coalescence, neutron um, star coalescence, which is thought is the favorite idea for what's behind the gamma ray burst, um, we should have seen it. We did not see it. So we could say that was not an event in M31. It must have been in a galaxy and it looks in that direction much, much further away, or we would have seen it. The second um, paper I highlight here was looking at the Crab Pulsar, which is one of the most famous pulsars. It gives off radio signals. It's like a beacon of um, a, light, a lighthouse except radio, and it goes round and round and round. It gives a signal every 20, uh, it's 25 hertz, so at one over 25 seconds. And we should have seen, if there was a little mountain, there's the little mountain by the way, Scott. Yeah, <laughs> if there was that, um, the, the um, orbit, that were not the orbit, but the spin of the crab is dying down. It's getting slower. That means energy must be given off in that system because it's, it's losing energy. Was that energy in gravitational waves? Well, it wasn't because we couldn't detect it, but we could put an upper limit to how much energy compared to if all that energy was given off in gravitational waves. And we, got, we were ready down to 4% of that energy being in gravitational waves. We could also put an upper limit on its ellipticity, so that's how non-spherical the object is. Well, we did all this but we didn't see anything. So rather than just keep working with LIGO, we had, to go, we had to do something about the sensitivity so that we had better chance of detecting gravitational waves. So we built advanced LIGO. 
let's look at what happens when you go from initial LIGO to advanced LIGO. Here's space. Here's how far out LIGO could see. If we increase the sensitivity of, of LIGO in terms of the strain sensitivity that we could detect by a factor of 10, we actually increase the volume of space by 10 cubes. That's a factor of 1,000. If we can do that, then we've got a much stronger chance of seeing events, maybe several signals per month, maybe even a bit higher than that when we reach our design sensitivity. So, um, funding was approved. This is from the National Science Foundation here in the US. Also, there were contributions from the UK, from Germany and Australia. And um, construction started seven years ago. And only last week, we finished the project. That meant we have built both detectors. Doesn't mean we're at our design sensitivity yet, but we, we did what we said we would do, funded by um, the NSF as part of the project. What we're now doing is commissioning the detectors to make them sensitive. And we're planning to do our first observing run September of this year. So we're working our way towards that aim. How sensitive are we going to get? Well, this is a projected sensitivity, and here I am again, the same plot. This is strain up the side against frequency along the bottom. One of the changes in advanced LIGO is we pushed the lower frequency side of our curve further down towards the left so that we should be able to pick up signals as low as 10 hertz. And how we did this, this is the blue is where we got to finally with the LIGO detector in its, in its initial form. And if we can increase the seismic isolation, reduce the thermal noise and use higher power, then we can get a better sensitivity. Let me just say one or two words about the curves in here that are all added to give the black one, which is the total noise. The blue curve is your quantum noise. On this side of it is shot noise. Turn up the power, you can reduce that. But, and there's a big but, when you turn up the power, you also increase another noise source at low frequency. It's called radiation pressure. All those photons are hitting our mirror, and there's a, a random noise about them, a random noise effect, it makes the mirror move. <coughs> And so, you, at the lower frequency, the quantum noise, which is the, the noise associated with counting photons, starts rising again and limits you. Then there are other noise sources in here. For instance, this magenta line is called coating browning noise. What on earth does that mean? Well, browning noise is this thermal noise I've talked about. And in fact, the coatings on the mirrors are jiggling around, or the molecules are moving around, and that's a noise source for us. And we can see that, in fact, just in here, it could limit us. And there's a lot of work going on at the moment to try and improve that noise source. But this is where we think we can get to with our current coatings. High power lasers, well, we up the laser power from 10 watts to 180 watts. And um, it's still working at this 1064 nanometer, and um, that's in the infrared. And uh, how do you do that? You get a very stable thing, a laser called a non-planar ring, os uh, ring uh, oscillator. You put it through two stages of, uh, of, of amplification, and then we also have to clean it up. What does that mean? It means that we want to get a nice Gaussian beam out of it, so that would just look like a dot without little hairy bits on the outside of it. And so you put it through something called a mode cleaner, and then that goes to the interferometer. This uh, laser was the contribution that the Germans made to the project. This LZH here is Laser Zentrum Hanover, and they provided the lasers for the two LIGO detectors um, at Hanford and Livingston. And this is just a picture of one of the lasers in, in action. How big is that box? Um, it's about, here it is. It's about, um, Eight feet long, Eric, is that about right? Yeah. The table is about nine feet long, and the blue box is about four and a half feet by three and a half feet. So it's quite, it's quite large. It's heavy. <laughs> the optics, so you think of mirrors, you probably think of something about that size, perhaps, where our optics are 34 centimeters in diameter, and they weigh um, 40 kilograms. Here's one of them um, being inspected to look at um, surface defects. We also have a Zygo interferometer that looks at figure, surface figure, um, and here is a, one of our staff 
cleaning one of the mirrors with a, a substance called first contact, which is a very interesting substance. It actually pours on like a liquid and then turns into a film, a bit like um, saran wrap. And then when you peel it off, it pulls off all the dust um, and then um, leaves a very, very clean surface. Um, this, is what, this is an interesting mirror. It's not actually one of the main mirrors, same diameter. It's called a compensator plate. When we deposit all this 180 watts of light into our mirrors, very little of it actually gets absorbed, but some does, and it actually makes the mirror into a lens. And we have to compensate for that with a thermal compensation scheme. And this um, gold barreled mirror is part of our thermal compensation scheme. And then here's the mirror as the bottom of a chain of suspensions, which I'll be talking about later. That's the same mirror down there, one of the test masses. Seismic isolation was another thing we had to improve, and how we do it is we have seven stages of isolation. This is one of the big um, vacuum tanks, and this is the mirror in here. It's actually the bottom of a four-stage pendulum. It's a quadruple pendulum. I'll say more about that shortly. But that gives you four stages of isolation. And that hangs from a two-stage act, and it's passive isolation, so it just hangs there, gives you the isolation. We have two stages of active isolation in chamber, there's a big hat that goes on top of this chamber, which is pulled off so you could see it. Um, and then there's a third, uh, and it uses um, electromagnetic actuation, an active isolation, which I'll explain in a minute. And then there's a third stage of um, a, uh, active isolation with hydraulic actuators that act on the support tubes that hold everything inside the detector, or inside this chamber. Active isolation means that you use inertial sensors to sense the fact that your object is moving and then you use a feedback system to actuators to cancel out that motion. So we have very, very high quality inertial sensors sitting inside this unit and here's, here's this, that purple unit being built up um, outside before it's installed. And um, you use those sensors, you use a feedback loop and you compensate for the fact the ground's moving and you still the object that you're, you're wanting to keep still. Now we also have to keep up our facilities maintenance. By the way, there's lots of other aspects of uh, LIGO, advanced LIGO, which I'm not covering. And if there's something in particular you might have heard of, you can ask me questions. But I thought this was uh, interesting just to show you the practical things we have to do. Here is part of the four kilometer arm length of LIGO. And you see that there's a cover over it, and that's a very useful cover. It also stops bullets down in Louisiana, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this driver went the wrong way somewhere and ended up crashing into it. If he had crashed into that pipe, it would have been really, really serious. Because we have to work at ultra-high vacuum, um, which is 10 to the minus 8 tor or better. And um, that um, is very expensive, and these tubes, you know, four kilometers worth of it, you wouldn't want to ruin that. Um, Hanford has tumbleweeds, and so this what, this what builds up against the um, pipes ever so often, and we actually have a baler on site so that the tumbleweed can all be baled and put away, because this is a, a big problem for us. Finally, about two years ago, we detected a small leak in the, one of the Livingston pipes, and people went in to look and see what it was, and they found a little bit of sort of corrosion they attribute it to rodents' output. I will not be too precise about that, but they had been nesting in there, inside the, inside the, on the tube. And so, apart from having to heal up that particular um, um, small leak, we have gone in for cleaning the whole four, two times four kilometers at both sides tube, um, tubes. And here's someone um, working on that. They're they're doing 16 meters a day, which is really really good. But if you want to do a little calculation, you can calculate how many days it's going to take them to do both sides, four kilometers arm length each way. Well, I've given you a, a little bit of an overview of advanced LIGO. My own particular area is the suspension design. That is the way we hold the mirrors so that they are free to react to the gravitational wave. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes um, just <coughs> explaining this. Um, what, what suspension design has to do and how we do it. So here is the optical 
layout is a bit more complicated than just two arms and a beam splitter. I don't really have time to go into all the other ins and outs of all this, but the, basically the red is the laser light. And if anyone is interested to learn more about how the optical system works, I'm very happy to answer questions later. But basically I'm talking now about how we're going to isolate these end test masses and inner test masses, the ones that are four kilometers apart. We have to decrease the thermal noise, cut down on the seismic noise. We need to damp the motion of these um, mirrors. They're hanging like pendulums and at their resonant frequency they're actually moving a lot because that's what pendulums do. We need to damp those actively using um, electromagnetic actuators. And we also have to control the arm lengths very precisely by feeding back on the mirrors. And so that all that has to be folded into our suspension design. A few words about thermal noise, I've mentioned it several times. So it's these excited, thermally excited vibrations of the pendulum, so it swings backs and forwards. The thing we call the violin modes, which is like plucking the suspension wire and it rings. And also just the breathing of the mass itself and the mirrors on its surface. How we um, reduce the effect of thermal noise is to use very high quality factor materials. Now high quality factor is equivalent to low mechanical loss. If you made a bell out of lead and you ding it, it would not ring very much. And that's because lead has a low quality factor and a high loss. But if you make it of a, a bronze, then you get a nice ringing sound. So we use high quality materials. And in particular, we suspend that last stage of our, uh, our, our mirror in its last stage of the pendulum on silica fibers, not on wires, not on steel wires. And that's because silica is a very pure material with a very high quality factor. And here's a graph to illustrate what I mean by that. Here's a one hertz pendulum. If you have a high Q, you get a very high peak at one hertz. But off resonance, the amount of motion you get is, is reduced compared to a low Q, high noise, which is the, is the pink or the purple curve there. Yes? And did I miss a, what is the resonant frequency of the hand So the final stage of our mirrors is actually slightly less than 1 hertz. It's about 0.5 hertz um, for our suspension. So it's about 60 centimeters long. So that's well below the frequency we want to um, operate the detector, which is 10 hertz and above. So we make sure, in fact, that all the resonances of our suspension are at those low frequencies. We sort of push them down. How does one isolate from seismic noise? I brought along <laughs> pendulum. Happens to be an apple as well, which is good for demonstrating apples falling to the ground. But um, what do you know about pendulums? I'm pretty sure you all know that if you excite them at a particular frequency, you can build up a lot of motion. Well, that's completely not what we want. We do not want a small amount of seismic noise giving us a huge motion. If I move my hand at a very slow frequency backwards and forwards, then the mass follows my hand very accurately. We say that the transfer function is equal to one at low frequencies. Transfer function is the ratio of the motion of the mass to the motion of my hand. Now, I can, with very small motions, I can set it really moving at about one hertz for this particular length. But if I now try and move my hand backwards and forwards at a higher frequency, which is a bit difficult, I tend to shake it up and down, but I'm not exciting it sideways. I hope you can see that. And the faster if I move my hand really, really fast, the better is the isolation, and that is represented in this graph here. This is the transfer function, that's the ratio of the motion of the, the mirror itself, or the apple or whatever, to my hand, and it's at 10 to the naught or 1 at low frequencies. It goes through a big resonance, but above it, it falls in fact as 1 upon f squared. If you have two of these, one on top of each other, so here's one, and my hand was also suspended, and that's a double pendulum, then you get, above the resonant frequencies, you get even better isolation. We use a quadruple pendulum, and so we get super duper isolation, so that by 10 hertz, we're actually at three times 10 to the minus seven. So that's the factor between the motion at the top 
to the motion of the mirror. And that's how we can get the sort of levels of isolation that we need in our detector. So here's um, what our suspension looks like. Here's the mirror. There's another glass object above that. It's not a mirror. It's actually there to be able to uh, help us to put in the fibers between these two masses. And there's two stages further up. And the, um, some of you might see that there's actually two chains, two quadruple pendulums. The one hanging behind has nothing to do with um, bouncing the light out on, on the arms. It's there to push against when we have to actuate um, to move the mirror itself. And the reason you want to actuate against a pendulum rather than just a fixed support is because it's a much quieter system to actuate against because it's also got its own isolation. And here is a picture of one of our suspensions actually built up. I led the suspensions team in advance LIGO, but by no means was it my, all my work. It was a big team who worked on it. I want to give you a sense of the size of it. They came from eight different institutions, four of them by the way you'll notice were from the UK, and the idea for the suspension system was developed for the GEO detector, that's the German UK one, and I was at Glasgow when we were first designing the advanced LIGO suspension. Here are some of my colleagues working on um, building suspensions. This was us cel celebrating after having a day in the lab. I'd like to point out that there were quite a lot of women who worked in the suspensions team. You can see six of us there. So it was very much a team effort. Technicians, scientists, engineers, postdocs, graduate students. Here's the idea that was used in GEO 600. These are smaller mirrors than LIGO, but basically you put you bond ears to the side of a flattened cylinder of your, this is your mirror, both top and bottom, and then you weld silica fibers um, between them. And here's advanced LIGO scaled up. It's a 40 kilogram mass, and this mass above also is 40 kilograms. You have to bond the ears, move the ear mirrors around, assemble these two glass pieces, and weld with um, a CO2 laser and then hang the whole thing. We pull our own fibers, whoops, and if I can, oops, get this going. No. Hang on, I just have to find my mouse, which has disappeared. There it is. Ah, is it going? Oh yes, it is. There we are. Good. So we custom built a fiber puller. Of course, fibers are pulled um, a lot in the fiber optics in 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 industry, but we had a particular requirements which um, were not met by that. We had to build our own. We used a CO2 laser. What you saw there was a mirror um, going round and round and heating one region of, the, of a rod, a silica rod, and then you pull it and the speed dictates the size of fiber you end up with. The fibers that we support our 40 kilogram mass on are less than half a millimeter in diameter, there's four of them, and that supports 40 kilograms. And that's just um, adjusting it, I'll just stop there. Um, can that really support 40 kilograms? Well, I have another little video here. We, mocked up 40 kilograms with some lead blocks and suspended them on four fibers. Here's the bottom of the fiber, that's the thick bit, but they go thin up here. And this person here is going to hit it with a hammer. <laughs> Oops, and I, I keep uh, losing my, there we go. And we do not break the fibers. <laughs> That's unbelievable, said my colleague there behind the scenes. So we did a lot of work in developing fibers. It's not just you pull them and they're, they're, they're ready. You have to polish them, in fact, to heal little surface cracks and so on. But when we spent several years developing the technique to make fibers that are stronger than the equivalent size of steel, equivalent diameter of steel. Now, we, we didn't just have to make um, 
big suspensions for this end mirrors and the inner mirrors. We call these the end test masses, inner test masses, a whole zoo of other um, suspensions that um, the, the suspension team were responsible for. I won't go into all the details, but for, for ones where you didn't need so much isolation, you don't need so many stages. So we had two stage ones and three stage ones. We call them doubles and triples. And here are some of my colleagues um, assembling suspensions, putting them together into this uh, structure unit, putting in the mirror. Then we have to get the thing into the chambers, because remember the whole thing has to go under vacuum. By the way, you'll notice they're all wearing bunny suits and gloves. That's because contamination of our mirrors could make them not um, as, as um, low loss, uh, optical loss, as we, as we need. So everything has to be clean. Also, because we work in an ultra high vacuum, um, when all the um, experiment is put into the tanks, and so you have to keep everything clean so you get down to good vacuum. And then here's one of the chambers with about three small triple suspensions in it. And um, this is a, a an excerpt from a film produced by Kai Stats called A Passion for Understanding, LIGO A Passion for Understanding. And if I can get it going, it shows you a high speed version of installing on site. So this is the big top of one of our chambers being moved out of the way. And here is us building up one of the cortical suspensions and the active isolation system that sits on top of it. And then we have to move it into its chamber and so it gets covered in this um, C3 cover which keeps it clean and then it's lifted by crane and it's moved around and dropped in to the chamber and here the covers taken off and then here we are setting up our mirror inside there's a whole film there which is very worth uh, while getting hold of so i come to the end of my talk where have we got to First of all, I kept talking about LIGO. I mentioned GEO, but there are other experiments around the world. There's also the advanced Virgo detector, which is a French-Italian collaboration at one three kilometer uh, detector sited near Pisa in Italy, very nice place to visit, I have to say. Then CAGRA is a Japanese detector. It is unusual in that they are trying to build a cryogenic detector. That is, they're cooling everything to reduce further the thermal noise. And it's been built in the Kamioka mines where the Kamiokande neutrino detector is sited. And then we have a third detector. It was going to go into the Hanford site, but in fact we put it in mothballs because um, India are keen to build a detector. They haven't quite signed on the dotted line yet. So our third LIGO detector is in fact being in put in storage for now, but we hope that the funding will go ahead and we'll build a third LIGO detector in India. These, the time scale is a bit further out. What's good about having all of these is if several detectors get uh, measure the same signal, you can use triangulation to pinpoint very well the position in the sky, and that can be very useful for what we call multi-messenger astronomy, where we would tell other types of astronomy and telescopes that we've seen a signal, go and look there, see what you see. So having a network adds to that. How are we doing? Well, um, if you remember, the best of the initial LIGO detectors, one we called in fact enhanced LIGO, got to 20 megaparsec. That was the distance out to the, you could see neutron stars. We are already at 67 with our Livingston site. And we're a little bit behind in Hanford because it was finished installation later. But how fast we've improved is the real thing I wanted to point out here. Over nine months, we went from half a megaparsec to 60 megaparsecs. It took us several years to do that sort of equivalent improvement in sensitivity with the initial LIGO detectors. We've learned a lot. We did a lot of prototyping before we installed advanced LIGO. We're going to do a run at the end of this year, 2015, and then we will, uh, as a sensitivity, somewhere between 40 and 80, then we'll continue to commission and do several runs, um, another one in 2016 and another one in 2017, where we hope we're, we're aiming towards our final design sensitivity. Do we expect to see anything in this first run? 
possibly, but you can't promise anything because um, the events are a bit rare still with that sensitivity. But when we get down to here, then detections are, are likely. I mentioned, and actually it was mentioned in the introduction, that Einstein's general theory of relativity was published in 2015. In fact, it was 2016 when Einstein saw that there was a wave solution in his general theory. And so it really would be wonderful if we could detect gravitational waves on the, on the centenary of the first formulation of the gravitational waves. So look out for this. I come to my last slide. Um, I've just got time. <laughs> um, so where have we got to? We've installed two detectors of the band's LIGO. We're now commissioning at both sites. Our sensitivity is re already well beyond where we were with the initial LIGO detectors. Our first observing run will start in September. And in fact, I haven't had any time to say anything about this, but in fact, people are already thinking of ideas for how we could even improve on advanced LIGO. And I can say more about that if anyone wants to ask me about that. You've seen from my LIGO scientific collaboration that there's a worldwide community working to try and detect gravitational waves to open up a new era of gravitational wave astronomy. And so keep your eyes open and for that announcement, I think we've got exciting times ahead of us. Thank you very much for your time.